All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, thank you guys ever for coming. And whew, this is the last talk of Salt Conf. I hope I don't let you down, but that's okay. But it's been awesome. Um, and for me, even I've been a salt user for a long time, I've learned like about four or five things I had no idea existed. And, uh, and it was like mind racking to think, okay, well, why do I deal with all this? How do I prioritize when I go out and do? And the kind of the question is, is you know, now what? So this is my one disclaimer. If you're in this talk last year, I will not be offended if you leave because it's very similar to last year's talk. Um, but before we start, I'd like to gauge our audience here. Who here considers themselves like a system administrator? Okay, who here is like a developer? Okay, who's, a, who's in management? Got a couple, okay, and who's, who here is like, I'm a DevOp? Gosh darn it. Okay, we, got, we have a really good mix, this is great. Um, so my confession is I'm a developer, and not only am I a developer, apparently I won an award for being the best PHP engineer in Utah. I mean, between Nano and PHP, I'm like losing my credibility with you guys right now. Um, but I'm all stuff taught ops. I worked at startups where we didn't have an ops guy. We, no sysadmins. We just had a scale and we were growing. I'm like, I'll figure this out. Um, so that's kind of my background on how I got into salt. Um, I'm the director of development technical engineering now of Desert Digital Me Media. Um, I basically make and break website stuff. i um, been using salt in productions.8. That's like three years ago. And I've contributed a few things to salt, uh, mostly documentation, but also a few salt SSH. I did the salt file stuff. All right, so this is basically lessons learned that we've learned here at DDM, where I work, um, and kind of an in, insight into our process of trying to do more and more DevOps. Um, copies will be on, posted online. Feel free to ask questions during the presentation, uh, but don't worry about taking pictures or trying to take quick notes, because I will blow through these slides really fast. It's just kind of uh, the way I do it. Um, about DDM, Desert Digital Man, uh, Media. Uh, we, if you're local, you probably know like KSL.com. We are the largest regional media site in the nation. So KSL.com, we probably do almost six to 10 times more traffic than your average local TV station traffic. It's because we have classifieds, we have all these other products. Um, and we do about anywhere between 10 to 20 million pages a day across all of our different sites. Um, and we have about 250, that probably is getting close to 300 now, um, internal VMs that we run. We have a couple dozen physical machines and we use some AWS for like transcoding and things like that. So I want to start with a story. And I want to say, you guys work for an awesome tech company. That's a given. You guys are at Salt Conf, you come here. You guys work for an awesome tech company. And your team is working really hard to build you know, new things. And so you work really hard and you launch, let's see if this might like, you launch your new product. And now this is great, this is cool. We got out the door, and then you start adding some new features, and some new features, and next thing you know, Bam, you got this big application and you're doing lots of different things and there's lots of moving parts. But you know what, it works, you're like, awesome team, we rock. Then your boss calls up and says, hey, I need this real-time feature you know, right now, like ASAP, our competitors are coming out with it next week, I wanna beat them to it. So of course, everyone has the same collective thought on your team, and then you start drinking the Red Bull. And then you start working like crazy and you work and you work and you work and your devs are working really hard. The developers here are your, you know, we're just like, oh, we got, we, it's almost working. And then someone says something probably along the lines of, hey, if I just turn off the caching, it works. And they've been working 80 hours, so it's not their fault. But they go ahead and they go and they push the button to go to production and say, I'm sure this works. They call their boss and say, hey, it's taken care of, it's released. <laughs> and they go and fall asleep. Now, a couple hours later, when customers are getting there, the packets are flooding in, the requests are flooding in, and of course, the ops guys in the room are like, hey, what the, what's going on? The servers are melting. <laughs> Things explode, there's a big cleanup effort, your boss gets burned, he's not very happy with you, and your coworkers and other people make fun of you and your team. <laughs> and it makes for a really sad developer, it makes for a really sad ops person, it makes a sad DevOps, and it's just like, oh my gosh. And so you say, we need a better solution. And so you take a step back and you look and you're like, well, where do we start? Like, we have all this stuff that we've built and all these servers and like, what, what do we do? And that was the problem that we faced at DDM. Originally, we were two different companies, Desert News and KSL.com. Desert News is a print paper since the 19, or 1850s. And KSL was the first TV station in Utah. That's why it has three characters and not four for its call sign. And KSL has all these products they also had their classifieds, their cars, their homes. And so we went and said, hey, we're going to take all the digital teams from these different companies and create the digital company, Desert Digital Media. And then we started making all these other products, and we added some more to KSL. 
I'm, I'm going to burn this clicker through. I'm doing it so fast. Um, but we have a lot of stuff. And so basically, we have this problem. And so we just sit out there, and we're like, oh, what are we going to do? And we look out into all these amazing companies out there who are like, they're like the DevOps kings of the world. And like, they do all these cool things and, and, and all these amazing things. And so one day at work, we had an, an, we had an epiphany. And we said, let's hire a DevOps. Let's go out and try and find someone who can, who can do this, and let's hire a DevOps. And I'm not joking, we actually said this. These words came out of our mouth. And there are two problems with this idea. Is that, number one, we didn't really understand what we wanted. Have you ever seen this meme where it's like, you know, step one, hire DevOps, step two, uh, step three, profit. But for us, it wasn't profit. It was just like everything works perfectly and magically. You know, that's, that's somehow we thought this would, this would work. The second thing is that uh, people who are really good at dev and ops are really hard to find. And because we didn't really understand the problem we were trying to solve, we had this really highly inflated expectation of what we want this candidate to do. And when we started interviewing people, we interviewed people for almost a year. Um, they didn't quite meet up to reality. <laughs> and it wasn't the candidate's fault. Like, oh, they were strong in this, but you know, person A had a different idea when they went person B. And so we basically wanted this demigod of a, of a, of a candidate. And it just wasn't feasible. It wasn't realistic. And so about after, I think it was about nine months to 12 months, we sat down, I remember we sat down in our meeting room, we said, okay guys, all the directors of the different engineering teams said, okay, this isn't working. We gotta have an honest discussion of what we're looking for, and what we're gonna do. And out of that meeting and out of what we came, kind of the new direction we took, we, is, we discovered a few things. Probably the most important thing for any company, so I'm gonna break real quick. Who here works, who has an ops team of less than 10 people? You know, about the majority, and then who, like less than 50? Like, you know, most, I mean, most people here, we have a few of the LinkedIn's, we have a few of these big people who have really large ops teams and really large DevOps, but most people I've talked to are actually really small. And we were kind of in that same situation. And so we had to go in and define, okay, we don't care about DevOps the term, the, the buzzword. What does that mean to us? And so we said, you know what? It's kind of this culture of collaboration. Um, and then our kind of our goal that we set at first is like, hey, let's do 10 deploys a day without a problem. And if you tell an engineer that, I'm going to push a button and it's going to deploy 10 times a day. Like immediately they kind of like, oh, and they can just like, you can see the nervousness on their face and you can kind of, they can identify really quick where all the places that might break, which is good because like, okay, we need to go in and solve those pieces. And then kind of the shared goal of everyone, ops and dev, we have a responsibility uh, for features, but also to keep stable, the system stable and up and running. And so I should have updated this slide. We actually have 38 developers now. Um, but so when we, our structure was pretty much we had about 30 developers and two ops guys. And so this idea we're going to hire this magical DevOps to solve our problem, that's not going to work. Um, you know, just one person is not going to be able to solve our problem. One of the good things we've realized is that, you know what, though we had one of the hardest parts solved, and that's we had really good people to work with. Everyone on the team, like there was, we didn't have any a-holes per se, and like everyone really wanted to, to, to be able to help and make things better. We just didn't know how to quite organize ourselves. We also know, knew that we weren't gonna be like doubling our team size in, in a year. We had to operate within our current team size because uh, we weren't gonna have any rapid expansion. Um, I think over the last two years we might have had added, we added, 30, we added eight developers. We haven't still added any new uh, ops people. Um, and we also discovered that some parts of the company were kind of doing a little bit DevOpsy things. Like someone had some cool real-time logging and some Capistrano deploys. And another part of the company, they had like Graphite. Like our, we had like Graphite with stats, and and you know our, our our ops team had their own little thing. And but they were all kind of walled off, and no one really was able to use or share the same thing. And so we said this this idea of hiring a DevOp, and somehow everything will work, is not going to work. And so we sat back and we formed a strategy. And the first step in that strategy was we took one of our developers and promoted him to the DevOps role. Now, some people might say, hold on a second, you just made fun of hiring a DevOps, what's promoting a DevOps gonna do? And what we did is we changed what we thought that DevOps was gonna do, and we made a very defined role. Before we had like, well, he's gonna solve everything, and this time we went in and said, no, this DevOps is gonna be in charge of the tools. He's gonna be in charge of being an asset to other teams to help them implement the tools. Um, and, and, you know, but, but he's gonna have a very defined role of helping, we're gonna pick one thing, and let's get that out the door. And then pick another thing, let's get that out the door and help the other teams implement it. 
Um, and this person also has to be very easy to work with. They need to have a good positive attitude, and they also have to be able to like to try new things. One of the advantages of promoting within is that the seasoned developer, he already knows all your pain points. He already knows the quirkiness. We have a custom XML library written in PHP. It doesn't use any even libxml that generates not real XML and doesn't read real XML, but it, they say it's XML. And our guy, you know, our DevOps, he knows all the weird craziness of what happened 10 years ago and, and some of the legacy stuff that we have. Um, and the other, well, probably one other important things, he knows the people and personalities on the different teams or on your team. And they're able to go say, hey, I know if I go to talk to person X, I kind of need to approach them this way. You know, they kind of like ideas this way and they're going to have these concerns. Whereas if you bring in a brand new person, they're just going to go walk around pissing off every single person on your team. It's like, oh, this guy just wants me to change everything I'm doing. So that was the first step is we went and took one of our, um, of our uh, dev, devs and gave them a very defined DevOps role. The second was we kind of changed our team structure. So it used to be we had the devs over there, we had the ops over there, and very segregated type of a situation. We took one of the devs and turned him to the, a DevOps, you know, the green body and the, and the orange head, um, and said, okay, they are going to be those, these are, this is going to be kind of an operations team, but they're all kind of in charge of devs and DevOps. And to embarrass them, none of them are in this room, but they're here with me this week. And so in the middle was our DevOps. He left my team and became our DevOps. And then we have Will and Nick on the sides who are, op, are, who are our traditional ops guys. But these guys are now writing just as much salt states as our DevOps is. They're getting, the, they're getting the logging and all these other cool tools in place just as much as our DevOps. And he's kind of acting as that bridge. The next thing is we had to separate our thinking of you have devs over here and you have ops over there. And then we have this tiny, tiny little overlace of, well, we have one DevOps. And say, so, you know what? Why don't we go ahead and try and push some of that ops expertise into the devs that we have um, and try and increase the ops among our developers? Um, and so what we did is we identified op, you know, devs who kind of like the ops stuff. There's some who don't want to touch it within, with a template pole, and that's fine. But you have some who's like, oh, like Vagrant and is kind of cool, or Salt's kind of cool, or identify those people and say, hey, we're going to help start getting you more involved in that crossover between dev and ops. Um, and then we would pair them with either an ops person or a director um, who we were already kind of bridging that gap. And then uh, we, we would uh, have the, de the person who was learning have them in the tools, have them in the things, making the changes, and the operations person or the director would just kind of advise and, and kind of help them out, but let the dev drive. Um, and we did some pair programming in some cases. So that's step two. Step three is you wanted to increase everyone, including the non-dev, not the non-opsy devs, um, increase their insight. So this is the first piece of Lego I found online, and then I found this one, which is way cooler. Uh, and that's how I envision how I want our monitoring system to be is like Iron Man. Anyway, so who I'm sure most of us have read this, but who, um, but um, Etsy has their blog Code is Craft, and like two years or three years ago now. They came out with this, this blog post about measure anything, measure everything. And they, they talked about their tool, StatsD, and how they use it with Graphite, and they're able to measure things. And so our first thing we said we wanted to tackle were metrics. And so um, for us, everyone has access to our network, our server, and application metrics. So we have different tools that gather this data, and we had some old systems that would put this in like money and, and other things. And we started saying, okay, we can keep those there, but we're going to pipe everything into, um, uh, into StatSD and Graphite servers that everyone has access to go look at. And now we have per, pro per major project has a, a StatSD server and service, and all of their servers and application metrics are going in there. Um, and, everyone can, and anyone can go take a look into that. Um, we try to consolidate the places to look. So we used to have all these different systems, and we kind of standardized and saying, okay, each major project, and there's about six of them, has its own graphite cluster or graphite server and, and uh, StatsD that we can use. And then we went through and we first rolled this out and no one was starting to use it. And so we, had, we found out that we'd have to go and, like with each developer, talk with them about a problem they were having, have them identify an area of the site, like, oh, it would be really good if we had metrics for this, and then walk them through adding that to the system and pushing that out of production. 
Once we train them to do that, then all of a sudden, like, oh, cool, I can, I can go and do this on my own. And that's kind of how we got that training out with our team. Um, and then we got to a point where we were worried about, about having our stat server go down, and we used UDP to send it. So if it goes down, production stays up. But we're, getting, we're trying some complex clustering things, and we said, you know what? I'm OK with 98% uptime. And if it goes down for a little bit, that's OK. I'd much rather just keep it simple than uh, having to be super complex. And if that changes down the road and I get a higher 10 new people, I might change my opinion. But for now, I'm OK keeping it simple. And so here's an example of one of our uh, graphing dashboards. Um, this is on an old one. Yeah, this is our old internal one. I would now recommend we use a, a Grafana, which is a UI for Graphite, um, which is really good. But you know, um, we're able to go in and see you know, all, the all the different metrics for the different pages of this one project. And then when we push to production, we send an event, and it puts a little line saying, hey, I pushed to production. So it's really easy to see, oh my gosh, I pushed to production, and this thing went crazy. And this is like everyone on the team has access and can use this tool. The second thing we went and tackled was, was real-time logging. Um, and uh, we're now primarily using a gray log too. Use log stash or some other thing to pipe that to Greylock 2. It uses Elasticsearch on the back end, and it works pretty good. Um, but between the metrics and the real time logging, it's kind of the two biggest key components to, to increasing everyone on the team their insight into what's going on in production. Um, and so, real time logging can be harder to scale depending on your site. For our, <coughs> um, for our popular websites, um, that you know, do the 10 to 20 million pages a day. Uh, you know, it was kind of tricky to make that work. Um, but what we did is, you know, and said, you know what, we're going to focus on having a small window. So we started off with 48 hours, and then let the logs drop off and rotate out, and say, you know, because 95% of the time, when they're, when I want to look at the logs, I want to see what's going on right now, or maybe what happened last night. But I don't care about two weeks ago, um, and our. Our parent company says one day they'll get Splunk running so they can audit until the back of time. And they told me that three years ago, and they still haven't gotten around to it. So whenever they get around, I'll, I'll pipe that to them. But, but for now, this is kind of what we're doing. Um, and then we generate some statistics off of our logs and send that to StatsD. Um, the, the next thing we did is we, we went through, and we, some things were in Git, other things weren't. And we said, OK, everything is in source control, period. End of story. Everything goes in source control. Um, we use GitHub. If you want to use something else, that's fine. Run a local instance of GitLab or whatever. We've liked Git. If you want to use SVN for everything, that's fine. But everything goes into a source control. And then everyone has access to the repos, technically. Um, everyone can see into them. Everyone can technically make changes to them. But we do all of our work through pull requests. And so if I need a change to go out into production, I can go look at, those, at that repository make the change, make a pull request, and let my ops team review it and say, yeah, that looks good. Instead of having to go to my ops team and say, hey, I need these changes, and I know you're super backlogged, so, but I need it now, so OK. So I can go and do that, and then say, hey, can you just review this and roll this out live? Um, and then, yeah, we have all of our, everyone's work code reviewed. We're not super hard and fast about that. If like We don't shoot people if they don't do that portion if they do a pull request and merge it themselves. Uh, but they better feel confident in the reasons why they did that and that it, why it was low risk. And if it does break something, then we shoot them. Um, but that's kind of how we operate. The next thing we tackled were deploys. And we t went and tried to automate all of our deployment process to a single step where you can go in and run a script. Um, and, uh, and then everyone on that team uh, on the team has access to deploy, even the most junior person does. Um, and then um, easy rollback is a requirement. And this is one where we're, on, we're still not super standardized in the company. We're starting to get there. I kind of came to SaltConf this year to look for deployment options um, and trying to figure that out. But we, but we did go through and make sure every team has a one-step deployment process. It can roll back, and everyone's trained on it. And then another thing we do is we implement feature, feature flags that we can toggle on and off uh, without requiring a production push. That way, if something weird's going on, we can just say, oh, we're going to turn off recommended stories on Deseret News. Because for whatever reason, that's slowing the page down. And I can just flip a flag instead of having to do a full production push. 
The next part were tests. Um, uh, we have all sorts of kind of tests, and you can look up all the different time. We primarily do, we have unit tests. Our PHP frameworks that have functional tests that kind of spin up a little bit more of the environment, we have those. And then we have, I guess, our acceptance tests. I call them browser tests. We'll use Casper.js, and they'll go out and can test the website after we do a production push. But the most important thing with tests is that if you want to trust your devs to push to production frequently and regularly, you want to have tests so you can quickly run them and catch errors before they go out the door, or catch critical breakages when they, when they push out live and say, oh, I broke login for my e-commerce site. People can't give us money. That's, you you want to know about that really quick. Um, and so for all of our legacy code, we went and wrote kind of the, these browser tests or integration tests that go out and test from the outside in. And all new code, we write unit tests. That way we can run that and have like Travis CI or Jenkins or something go and build and run those tests every time there's a commit. I've been talking about any questions? Okay. So this is salt conf. And so you might be asking, okay, where's the salt? And I have the wrong picture. That's okay. So DevOps used uh, the, the devs use the ops tools. And so one of the cool things about salt that I found is devs can, for the most part, can grok salt. They can, they can go and they can kind of figure it out, especially if you have a DevOp or someone there who can kind of a answer questions. But you do need a kind of a safe environment for them to learn. So who's, who, who can spot the problem in this command? <laughs> okay, good. I gave this talk to a group of developers. It took them a couple seconds. And that's why you need a safe environment. So there's a space right here. And salt is awesome, but that will run. And in one of my other salt demos I give at other technology conferences, I'll spin up like 40 servers and I'll ask them, hey, who wants, me to see, who wants to see me foobar 40 servers in parallel? <laughs> And we do that. And I make sure I'm, I'm always running on my demo environment I spun up in the cloud and not in production, because then I'd be fired. <laughs> and so our first, our devs get their first experience is we use in the, with their local dev environment. And so we use Vagrant. Um, we use Vagrant and then we use Salt to provision those boxes. Um, and the devs are responsible. So if they, need to, if they need to go in and say, oh, I need this library, I need whatever, they make the changes in Vagrant and in their salt mat in their salt state files and they and they run that um, <coughs> and uh, and then our devops guys hop, help advise us if we ever need it the next part that we do is we have what we call team master servers and so we have you typically have a master and a, and a, and a minion um, and so each project so there's about six, there's six of them we have six salt masters, and those control the 10 to 20 servers. Here, let me just go to this slide and tell you. Those control the 10 to 20 servers that manage that server, that, that, that for that project. And then we take the trusted developers, so typically, you know, um, most all our senior and directors have access, and then some mid-level, that's kind of one of the growing things that we do, we give them access, and they have access to that salt, um, that salt master. Uh, we go in and we disable command run, I think that's the only one we disable. Uh, but, but overall, say, hey, you, they can use salt to kind of figure out what's, go to get a look into what's running on the servers without having to give them the SSH access to the entire environment. And then all of these team masters use salt syndic and report up to the ops master. And that's the one that has control to all 300 and all of our infrastructure and everything. And I don't have access to that. And none of our developers have access to that. It's our ops guys that take care of that. Um, and then everything salty, we put in Git. All of our salt manifests, I mean, everything goes into Git. Uh, our stage environment and our production environments, they use the same salt repositories. They, they all run off the same um, master, they run off master. Um, and typically what we'll do is we'll have the production manifest as it is, and then our stage environment, which is just delineate using pillars, we'll have like a role, you know, project-stage, project-prod. And then it will include all of the salt production states, and then maybe do a couple tweaks if we need to do some tweaks. Typically setting some environment variables saying, hey, this is stage, and that's about it. Um, and then if we need something out the door, so let's say I'm working on a project and I need a new Mongo library for PHP or for whatever it may be. Um, as a developer, I can go into our salt repositories, say, hey, I need this, make the pull request, and have the DevOps, chain, have the DevOps team look it over and then we'll push that out and run that almost right then. 
Um, we will typically look out in the future and, and we'd rather have our environment be ready for a change. And have, so if, it, if that's a requirement, production will install those libraries probably weeks, if, probably weeks before we actually push that code live. That way when we push to production, we're not worried about did I install, did I run the salt high state to make sure everything's good. Um, yeah, and so that's why we, we worry about environment changes before we code. And then we always do very, very small, you know, we make very, very small changes and push them out all the time. Uh, if we ever have massive changes to, to our, our high state, or our, our salt states, we'll typically like do one small change, push it out, do the next small change, push it out, and never these big batch operations because it always seems that something might go wrong and then we have to fix it really quick. Um, one tool that we do use is we wrote is called Trogdor. It's written in Node, um, but it helps us provision on every branch. It gets its own stage environment. And so if I push the branch new feature, I could go to newfeature.stage.example.com and I can see that branch in isolation. It's technically open source. It's like version 0.0.1. If you're interested in using this, come talk to me. There's like no documentation. There's nothing. But my goal is to get that done in the next week or two. Uh, so shoot me a message if you want to Check it out, uh, but it works pretty good, and I'm trying to get it to work with uh, Docker or LXC uh, containers, so that way you can con just use those containers to do that. Um, for our production environment, basically when we're ready to push anything to production, we just run, well, infrastructure changes like libraries and stuff, we'll just run high state, and once again, small quick changes. We, this is like, this is the, lowest, the most zero drama part of our setup is just, these really, we run it on stage first, if it works, we'll run it on production and we do very, very small changes. And then we have a rule, high state must always be safe to run. When we first started out, we, do, we would do things like clearing caches, like we, because we used to couple our deployment with high state, which is an awful idea, don't do that. Um, and so we would do things like, if you ran high state, it would technically like run the build scripts for a project and clear the caches. And we'd have one project run high state or our, our ops team would go in and make a change for something like um, Heartbleed, sort of statement they want to push out an update to all the servers, and they run high state, and if, if the build script, if NPM's down or something, and, that, and we have a small project that they run high state and it breaks that, that's, a, that's something we don't do. So our high state must always be safe to run, and if you ever have s scripts that go and do certain actions against servers, we'll break those out into separate salt state files, and we'll run those individually, like, hey, repair, these MySQL databases, you know, do this to this Mongo server. We'll have those in separate st state files, but those don't get included in, into the high state. <coughs> um, a couple things, uh, while the devs are awesome, there's stuff we don't touch. Uh, all of our physical VM hosts, our physical load balancers, our firewalls, our switches, all that stuff, we don't touch with a 10-foot pole. Our ops team's awesome, we let them take care of that. And anything that's super sensitive or critical, like our data sources, our ops team takes care of that too. It's primarily the application servers that you'll have developers make changes to in, and do a pull request and have that push out. So the next part is mentoring your developers. And I touched on this briefly before, but not every dev is gonna become an awesome dev op, and that's okay. We have some awesome front end people who's, who's amazing what they do. We have awesome back end people who are amazing what they do. They're not great DevOps, and that's totally fine. You, you, but we'd like to have a nice variety of people. Um, and so the way we think about it is we want every developer, so developers who think about how their code's gonna run in production and how it's gonna impact operations, we want everyone to be able to think like that. Able to debug issues in production, so we want almost all of our developers. Maybe not our interns, maybe not our junior developers quite yet, but we want to make sure that that's a goal that almost our whole team is able to do debugging and production and be able to solve problems without having to talk to the ops team. Um, we want the majority, so like our senior developers and up, to be able to make changes to environments and get that reviewed by the ops team. And then we look at our developers to, to find some of these awesome DevOps people and find a couple of those and grow those expertise in there. So today we had, from our company, there's five of us. There's me, the speaker, who's a dev, the three ops guys and DevOps guys, and then we have another developer who came with us who's really good at this kind of stuff. And this is kind of like our farm program, like if, you know, so you know, like our junior leagues of like trying to raise up some this expertise in our company. So after doing all of this, our awesome, our company's awesome, right? We're, everything's perfect, pie in the sky. 
And to be honest, we still have lots of skeletons in our closet. We still have a long ways to go, but we've made a ton of progress over the last two years of saying we want to increase the collaboration between our operations team and our development team and have stable systems that work and run as they're supposed to. And so kind of where we're at right now is all of our, all of our development environments use Vagrant and Salt. Almost all of our staging and production environments are salty. There's a couple of legacy things out there that are like 10 years old that we haven't saltified. And I'm hoping before I have to salt them, I can just unplug them and throw them away uh, within the next year or two. We're getting there. Uh, some of our legacy stuff salty. Uh, and then we're just always just kind of working and looking for opportunities to get stuff out, stuff out. So this is for our team. The question is, how do you guys make this for you, work for your team? All your teams have different scenarios, different products, different situations, resources, whatever. I would first start with an honest introspective and determine for your team, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are some of your critical problems and then goals that you can use to solve those problems? Uh, the next step is to try and increase your team's insight. So make sure that devs can see and understand how their code performs. That's why those metrics are so important. When they push something out, they can go, oh crap, I did something. Instead of your ops guy of going, why is this server tanking all of a sudden? And then increase the responsibility on your development teams to use those metrics. Um, I have a very strong thing. If they, fix, if they break it, they fix it. I rarely bail people out unless like serious money's on the line um, and say, hey, it's how you learn. You broke production. And if we're not completely, completely down, you're going to quickly fix it. And I'll help you as much as I can, but you're doing the typing. And that way they can learn and they can sweat and feel that wonderful pleasure of, of their heart pumping and all that fun stuff. And then everyone can see everything. This is really important, that, that, that transparency, and everyone has access to the stuff that, need, that they need. When it comes to mentoring developers, um, you know, give your developers a safe environment to learn. Letting them learn the tools on their local environments is a great way because they can totally hose their Vagrant environment and they can type Vagrant Destroy and Vagrant Up and they're okay. You can't quite do that with your production data servers. So this is a great way to do that. Um, let them go ahead and submit their code review changes uh, for your stage environment and production environments and then code review that. Uh, and then what's really key is whenever you're teaching and mentoring someone, make sure they're the one driving and you're just offering advice. And then this does take time, but it's worth the investment. I had my junior developer just the other day made pretty, some, some, a, a handful, like three different pull requests for some changes in a production environment. He's, I mean, and this guy's junior, but, uh, but he's, he's making a lot of good progress. And I think in five years, he'll be probably one of our, our top DevOpy guys. Um, so, have, has anyone seen the, the commit strip? Is anyone here familiar with this comic? Awesome. Okay, so, uh, you know, people like to use the term DevOps a lot, uh, and I and this this strip, this comic strip, is a very good explanation of kind of are you on the right track to doing DevOps or you're not? It's not really about the tools you're using. It's not really about you know tiles on the team. It's more about this culture. And so here you have this. Uh, Hot fix, hot fix ready, all tests passed, consider it pushed already. That's DevOps, not DevOps. Tomorrow we will have our biannual and manual internal pro products pushed to prod. Expect bugs at least. Yeah, I'll be off, great. Next one is this one. Uh, let me look into that, I'll fix it right away. That's a very DevOpsy thing. You have the developer and the ops guy looking together. And the not DevOps. What's that infinite loop crashing on my servers? I'll restore my, the version from 2005, you idiot. That's not uh, very DevOpsy. Um, DevOps, hey, I've created a Docker image off the app already and available in our private repo. You know, and we we actually don't use Docker or anything like that, but that uh, that that ability, hey, I'm using the same tools that the ops guys are using. And then the not DevOps, there's no PHP 5.6 available. It's none of my business. Fix it. And finally, I've never seen such a beautiful beard. And they're not DevOps like, hey, who are you? We've never met before. And are you kidding? I've been working here for three years. <laughs> so, that's, so that's a good way of kind of looking and evaluating. Because for me, as we've gone through this process, it is, DevOps is not a set of tools. Don't let anyone from SaltStack hear this. But you can use Salt to do DevOps, but you can use Salt to not do DevOps. Uh, but it is totally 
more of a, an attitude and culture that you, that you have in your organization. So a few final thoughts. Once again, we have this problem. We went through and heard all these awesome things that we can possibly do, you know, and we think that there's this mythical unicorn of DevOps out there, of this perfect system that does all these amazing things, and then you go back to your office tomorrow and it doesn't quite <laughs> match what you were hoping. My, my recommendation is just focus one thing at a time. Focus one thing at a time and say, you know what? There's a thousand things we can do. I could go implement rate and beacons and engines and blah, 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 all this stuff. You know, just one thing at a time. If salt's not running on your servers yet, just go install salt on the servers. Get a master set up. And just that way, that, that way when heartbleed happens, the next heartbleed, probably within the next year or so, who knows what that, whatever bug that is or shell shock or whatever, you'll, instead of, instead of spending all night patching your servers, you can take five minutes like I did. I saw the news, I'm like, oh, laptop, run the script, okay. Updated, oh cool, I'm gonna go back to sleep. And that was it. I had, I had buddies who were up all night patching servers, not us. And but if, if that's where you gotta start, that's fine. If you have metrics but not real-time logging, start with real-time logging. If you need real-time logging more than you think you need metrics, like we have internal tools that deal with workflows, they don't really need monitor of the metrics because it's like pretty consistent. Like, no, like you have five or ten things that process every hour, but how that step of uh, those order, how that gets executed, is really important. And so they need a real-time logging before metrics. That's fine. Just pick something, and then prioritize for your bang to buck ratio. Um, it's really easy to look for the perfect ideal solution, and you can get about ninety percent of there on about fifty percent effort, and then you can spend that next another fifty percent effort on just getting it just perfect. A lot of times it's not worth it. Get a pretty good solution in place and then move on and go, and go find another thing that's low hanging fruit, get a lot of uh, bang for your buck. Your team culture matters. Um, being a posit being, being like how your team interacts with each other, how they treat each other, that is so crucial. That's like the underlying fabric of the way DevOps works. Because if you have a bunch of a-holes talking to a bunch of other a-holes, you're not gonna get any DevOps done. Um, and you may be in an organization where you feel like you have no control, there's nothing I can do, it's all out of my hands, I'm just, a, I'm just an ops guy, I'm just a sysadmin, I'm just a developer. I truly believe being a plot positive influence can affect change. It's not gonna happen overnight, but you can slowly help your coworkers and your organization move in the right direction. All right, any questions? Did you guys have a good salt cough? Was that good? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. If you ever want to get a hold of me, you feel free to email me or hit me up on Twitter. If you're on IRC, I'm in the Pound Salt channel. I'm also in the UPHPU, which stands for the Utah PHP User Group. Don't make fun of me. And, uh, and I put my email address for my website. It's just in carbon.com, though. So uh, that's all I have. Any other questions at all? Okay, thanks.